So, uh, hello Hans, we are in the Hans Belting Library of Berlin. So, uh, I think my first question will be, um, why one part of your library is not here anymore? One part of my library is now in Brno. And this is a fantastic story. There was first a surprise of being invited to give a talk in Brno, uh, advised by Herb Kessler. The second surprise happened when the first volume of Convivio came. Because I could see this is a new Seminarium Conacovianum. This is again a crossing border between East and West. And this time the inspiration comes from the East to the West. So, of course, Czech Republic is Middle Europe, I know, but still this internationalism was fantastic. And then the third surprise came when I arrived in Bruno and experienced that there was a very enthusiastic and very knowledgeable group of young medievalists led, guided, instructed by Ivan Folletti. And so at this moment in December 2013, I think. 14. 14. Even, even so, a few time ago, a little time ago, I immediately talked to Ivan Folletti whether we could uh, transfer part of my library for the help of these young students and for research in medieval studies of a new kind in Bruno. Well, no, I, I, I remember when we were opening the library, you thought also about the question of who is the owner of the books. And you thought something for me beautiful, that have a book don't mean to buy it, but to read it. Could you develop a little bit this question? Well, this is one of the central questions of our moment in time now. What will happen with the books? Uh, of course, um, the book is a dead object if it is bought or sold. The book becomes to life once you open it. And the book has many advantages over the internet which will eventually become to, to sight. But my vision was that young readers use books which have already the marks of time in them. They are imprinted by their history. You can see physical objects which went through several hands until they arrived in Bruno. And, well, you were also talking about um, Brno as a place between East and West. You spoke also about Seminarium. Why do you think it's so important to have those places between East and West? Well, you know, Europe is um, cut of its real size if Eastern Europe or Middle Europe is behind the border. That was the case, unfortunately, between the Second World War and 89. And now the border is overcome, but uh, the borders exist still in the brain. And for me, I was always excited that Europe lives from a history, a joint history of Eastern part and Western part, Byzantium and Catholic, Protestant Europe, Europe is such a rich country, is such a rich continent. And I think it is now intellectually in necessary mm -hmm. to speak to each other, to open again the discussion. So the, 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 the United Europe in not maybe political sense, but let's say in intellectual sense. Absolutely. As the answer to our world. Absolutely. And think what uh, Czech history and Russian history means in, European, in Europe's cultural history. So I was del delighted to see there might be a new start of a young generation who also needs the books from the great interval 
between the beginning of the Second World War and 89, when really the traffic of books and traffic of ideas was very slow. And today we have a great uh, task to fulfill. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we reconstruct, if we reopen the intellectual communication in Europe. Yes, no, that, that, that's of course a sort of beginning of something new. I feel it like that also. Um, for me what's also interesting is that you are a scholar are a person who always unify the words. I mean, your book, Built with Kult, is maybe the first book uh, who considered the what-if image in the East and in the West like a unique phenomenon. Could you explain me why? I mean, how, how the idea comes to you to unify those two apparently so different kind of images? Because an 18th century image is not similar to a 12th century Eastern image. Yes. Well, in my youth, uh, the unification of Europe began. And Europe was in our heads, in our hearts. But then I discovered soon that this had a great bias, that we talked about a small Europe, which could politically unite at this moment. Mm -hmm. But that was not all of Europe. So it was only in the uh, United States, in Dumbarton Oaks, that I made the contact, that I met people, representatives of Eastern Europe. This was a great surprise, and it was paradoxically in the States, where I met emigres from Eastern Europe, like Dvornik, who was very influential on my early career. And so I have always this nostalgia of a Europe which lost its full size and its full life and the interaction between minds in Eastern Europe. And then we have all this wonderful history going back to Byzantium, to the Roman Empire. So there are so many reasons why we need to reopen uh, intellectual discussion between East and West. And, and, um, when, you, when you were, let's say, before the end of the communist era into the East. You visit Moscow, you visit Tbilisi. Um, how it was for you? I mean, you feel the sort of intellectual unity with persons like Lazarev or Chubinashvili, or you had really the impression to enter into the different world? Well, Georgia is a separate case from Russia. Georgia was a great surprise to me either at the time, in 1970 because Georgia felt very European okay. and not Eastern at all. They, they felt their own past and their own souls were more in tune with Europe than with, of course, the Soviet Empire. This is clear. And Lazarev uh, had many times visited uh, the West and lived in the West so he had still this uh, flair mm. of an international elite with him. But he was isolated in a way, because his students had not made this experience. So there was a really a gap of generation between the ones who could have traveled and who had a life experience of Europe mm. and those who only read about Western Europe and never had visited it. So this was an unhappy experience to see that borders at the time closed. But there were people in Russia, for instance, who had crossed the borders in their lives. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the main question seems to be crossing the borders, if I understand yes, well. Yes, absolutely. That's the main question of also, because if we could imagine, if you could tell something to the young generation of the students of today, our students of art history, you will tell them you have to cross the borders? Yes. Well, this is also in my field of art history, the real task. Uh, art history customary 
speaks about something which is like something else, mm -hmm. but not speak about something which is different from something else. And if you cross the border, you have the experience of the one side and you gain the experience of the other side, which means you are richer, you are much richer and you can get a better idea of your own identity mm. if you have crossed the border. So, because one of the things which are for me difficult in Central Europe, for example, is a certain autoreferentiality, that people studies almost only Czech art. And my feeling was always that something is not good in it. Do you, do you share this impression? I mean, it's good for Czech scholars to go out. Well, this also um, happens in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a very strange relation to our own art. And many art historians are Renaissance Italians by, by choice. But uh, I wrote several books on which, in which I questioned the German way of dealing with their own history and with their own art. For instance, with the history of two different kinds of arts, mm -hmm. the Catholic and the Protestant. So I think the autoreferential is dangerous because you don't learn enough in order to understand your own culture. You have to understand other cultures in order to have an idea, a concept of what your own culture is. And Middle Europe is in between. And in between is the best place in intellectual sense and in practical sense where you can be. In between is you cannot avoid to have two sides. And Middle Europe was a captive of the um, Soviet Empire. Now it is free, but it's still searching for its own path. Mm. It is right. Well, thanks to you, we are now in one common project with Berlin, Iconic Presence. Could you tell me a little bit about this project which we share now? Yes, it was a risk to um, conceive this project because uh, it's not art history in the narrow sense. It's an image theory or iconology and it's um, a possibility for two disciplines at least to meet three disciplines, anthropology, art history and religious studies. And in the moment I see that religious studies are approaching us with their mm. question. In the question for the material side and the iconic side of religion, not only for the theological or the conceptual side, not only the theological, but the anthropological side. So it is very good if several disciplines can meet and find new answers and new questions. And, well, no, that's interesting because the religious studies seems to me in some sense also the, the base of what you thought about art history, because this basic idea of religious studies, you need to know more religion to understand yeah. Yeah. your religion, let's say, yeah, or absolutely. one of them. Yeah. It's maybe your point of view also in art history. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, This Eurocentric, Eurocentric bias is also in Christian theology and inspired the missionaries all over the world. That there is only one religion which is Christian religion and the rest is something else. So I think we, we are at a moment also in this way to open our minds for the human condition in religion. The, the, why, why do humans need religion and what is religion? Mm -hmm. We cannot always answer it only with a Christian religion. Also a kind of um, intercultural approach will help us to open up. And the main thing is not that we understand everything and we study everything, but only to open our mind for new vistas. 
Okay, so I, I will maybe have a last question, which is um, if you in some sense could say something to the students in Brno, because they are probably looking now our, our, our discussion, what do you would say to them? Which kind of reason they have to study the art history? Why to do our job? What's the reason to become art historian today? Because art history leads to many questions which deal with their own identity. I mean, they are in a post-communist, post-Eastern Europe, in a post-religious world, where they rediscover the roots. And to discover the roots is something amazing. Because you suddenly understand yourself and where you are coming from, where you are, where you are going to. And so I hope this uh, enthusiasm to discover something which actually is your root and which you discover, not possess, you have to discover it. And to depart, to start into a new intellectual and it, it new and rich intellectual life. So they will not all get enough positions in this field, but they will be rich in what they have learned and not only what they experience in everyday life, which is also always banal. They have, they have their own past, but only when they discover their past. Well, great. Thank you.